you see that over time, computers have become uh, smaller and smaller. They're still actually quite powerful. They've become a lot more mobile, and uh, they have become much easier to access and much faster to access, and they've become more personal. And one of the questions that we had a few years ago at Google was, what is going to be the next one? So what is the natural evolution of this thing going to the next big platform? And Google Glass was one possible answer to that. A computing uh, and communication platform that's in this form factor, and it sits on my head, and it's significantly more mobile, more personal, and faster and easier to access than the preceding computing platforms. And just actually to um, put it in context, this is how it looked actually a few years ago when we started, when we wanted to have all these functions integrated on someone's body, the display, touchpad, all the electronics and communication and, and uh, computing. There are a number of things that are unique to this uh, form factor. We, so, so we talked about the evolution of computing. And uh, very importantly, this is a device that's very aware of its user. So it sees the world actually through my eyes. It has a camera actually that's looking out. It hears what I hear. And uh, it even knows that I'm walking, I'm turning uh, my head around. We've never actually had devices that were so aware of the environment, the user's environment, and they were so aware of the, uh, the things that the user, uh, user does. So this is, a, this is a device that's actually quite intimate to the, to the user. And the modes of interactions of the user with this kind of computing will be very different. A couple of things that excited us, even though uh, these were not the necessarily drivers of the first generation device, where the ability of uh, a computing device like this to overlay computer-generated images onto what you would normally see. So I would have my normal vision, and on top of that, in principle, this device can superimpose something else. This field is called augmented reality, which is a pretty, pretty exciting area. So you can always see more uh, should you enable your computer to show you, show you things. And uh, lastly comes the issue of the screen size for mobile devices. So how many of you in the audience actually have a smartphone? If you don't mind raising your hands. OK, pretty much everyone. Um, how many of you would like to have a bigger screen on your smartphone? Most people. How many of you who are uh, willing to carry a cell phone that's this big? OK, no one. It's a problem. So we have a basic physics problem here that uh, most people use smartphones. Most people want to have much bigger screens on their smartphones because it's easier to use and more comfortable, more powerful. But there's just a certain size of device that people are willing to carry around with them. So how do we solve that problem? This form factor, because of direct projection into your eye, can potentially solve that problem. So you can have a massively wide screen from a very tiny device. So the physics of this is actually quite different from a device that I would look at, actually. It's in my, he uh, in my hand or sitting on a, on a desktop. So there are certain things that are unique to this, uh, unique to this platform. Um, however, the uniqueness doesn't justify actually creating, creating this alone. Um, we have packed a lot of technology in this device. And really, the big question is, why on earth would you want to do that? We have other devices. Um, what's the utility of this type of technology? Let me give you an example. So, Let's say you're walking downtown uh, Boston, and you want to tell your significant other that it's a nice day in Boston, it's a sunny day in Boston. You can send them a text message so that conveys a type of emotion. You can call them, which is usually nicer, so they can connect with you a little bit more and uh, tell them how your day goes. Or you can wear a device like this, and this device actually can live stream video through my point of view to someone else and walk in Boston. So they can experience your life as you're experiencing it live. And uh, we found it actually to be absolutely magical to be able to share these moments with other human beings. So that has been one of the main drivers of our work to this date. So we wanted to have a device that someday, and today we cannot do it. Tomorrow is unlikely that we can do it. Perhaps someday in the future somebody can do it. We wanted to have a device that would let you do, uh, do the following. If you have a question, Instead of you having the question, knowing that you have to go grab the answer from somewhere and come back and look at it, you get the answer back so fast that you feel you know it that fast. So sub-second, basically. Very, very fast. And that makes a material difference in what you feel you know. It actually may change the meaning of knowing things. 
and definitely has a major impact on education. So we can talk about that in the panel if you're, if you're interested. But this is what we wanted to do. So we have a computing device that's extremely fast to, to access, and on this device right now, I can get a Google search done and get the answer back right in front of my eye in a second or two. So it's actually quite fast. Not fast enough, not where we want to be, but that's where we want to go someday. And I think it's gonna have a major impact on uh, how people would view uh, knowledge and information in the future. Uh, where does the device go? Um, as I said, we think this is just the first step. It's a very solid first step. Uh, we also know that we need to improve this uh, significantly in every aspect of it, uh, hardware and software. So the main driver for this is electronics, obviously. Everything has to get much smaller. We would like to have other types of sensors, and we do want to have the ability to compute a lot more with a lot less power.